Uh, Mr. Nee, I know very well. I'm also a member of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group. And at times, we are always at uh, loggerheads with those who are in charge of regulations, despite the fact that they are our partners. And I know the drama that happened in the last three years between us and the federal government. I want to thank you and also appeal on behalf of the students who will be looking towards uh, getting a photo opportunity with you today. Please uh, grant them that request. Thank you. Uh, may I also take this opportunity to invite our keynote speaker, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Let me just say a few words about the Nigeria Economic Summit Group. It's a think tank, and it's a place that has and is spending sleepless nights to see that we get things right for the Nigerian economy. So I want to thank you for being our shepherd right now as the president of the Economic Summit Group. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me not occupy the space that I'm not deserving of. Please put a round of applause for Mr. Ni Yusuf as he makes his presentation as our keynote speaker. Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for the opportunity. Madam Chairperson, Israel Nais, the publisher, ladies and gentlemen. I hope the organizers can load my presentation. All right, good. All right, thanks. So it's an interesting topic, and I think the opening remarks of uh, Mrs. Awoshika has laid by the essence of what we are here today. So I'll be speaking to how we can stimulate growth, how we can tame inflation um, from both a fiscal and monetary policy point of view. If you move to the next slide. So four areas I'll delve into quickly within the 20 minutes or 25 minutes that have been allotted. First is really just to understand the macroeconomic objectives that most authorities are focused on. And second, it's what's happening globally and, of course, within our own country. And thirdly, we look at how fiscal and monetary policies could be used to simulate growth to tame inflation. And we then share a few recommendations in terms of way forward um, for us to consider as, as different actors in the economy. Next slide. And so for most officials, there are few objectives in terms of microeconomic objectives that we all focus on. First is really around low inflation, price stability, or if you take the US Fed, it's about jobs and low unemployment. And for us in Nigeria, it's also around maintaining the FS reserves and maintaining the stability of the, of the um, currency rate. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, to drive economic growth in a sustainable, stable manner that can then cater for the different needs of the actors. So these are the four, I'll call it four main essence um, of any macroeconomic um, official or observer. And so the question we'll ask ourselves is, how are we doing? Next slide. And I think we all know how we are doing. So if you look at 2022 from the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, we think there are six major themes that characterize the way the Nigerian economy performed last year. Global supply disruptions from the Ukraine war has led to global inflation, but we also have our own local inflation. So inflation was a big issue. And because of inflation, the Federal the Monetary Authority, the CBN, increased the NPR, the monetary policy rate, at in four times last year, and was increased again yesterday to 17.5%. So trying to use interest rate to tame inflation. And what that has, what has, has done is increasing the prices of goods and, of course, of services. As a nation, we have a huge debt burden, and some say we are now at the cliff of a debt crisis. So the Minister of Finance believes it's a revenue is about 2.8. Um, so the, the economy is growing, but at a very slow 
pace and we're a nation in a hurry. So fit to 20 million, we need to be having double digit um, growth in the economy. Next slide. And so that's 2022. But 2023 will not be any different if you don't make drastic changes, if you don't take tough decisions. Most, authority, most authorities have projected a 3% economic growth. At the Economic Summit Group, we think it will be a slightly below 3%. But whether it's 3% or 29 or 3.2, that's not where we need to be. Because inflation this year is also projected to remain double digits. And so it's clear that we need to find ways to reduce inflation and also find ways to propel growth. And of course, that speaks to the essence of the topic for today. Next slide. And the CBN itself has recognized that inflation below 12%, sorry, higher than 12% is not good for economic growth. So I think all authorities are aligned on the need to reduce inflation rate to single digits. Because if you don't do that, the prices of goods and services will continue to get out of hand. And so inflation eats everything, including eating profits. And that is quite concerning. Let's slide. So a bit of inflation is needed, but we don't need double digit inflation growth. So I'll spend some minutes talking about what's happening globally. If you move to the next slide. There are, beyond economic issues, there are also political issues to worry about. And that's why some economists talk about the political economy. Because the economy operates within certain um, political factors. And so there are areas of high risk, of which Africa, Asia, are smartly in the middle of those high risk. Whether it's political risk, economic risk, was if it's just the Russia and Ukraine um, war. And so those risks will also affect the choices that we need to make and will also affect the economic decisions that our authorities need to make this year. Next slide. So the global risk will affect where people will invest their capital, where talents will migrate to, as we're seeing now in Nigeria. And if you look at the structure of the economy last year, you know, in the last two, three years, it's been a bit tough globally. We've all had COVID-19, and just as we thought we were getting out of it, there's a new um, one now happening in China. We hope that won't be exported to the world. But COVID-19, the Russian and Ukraine war, those two factors have impacted the global economy severely. And last year, we've seen close to a trillion impact of um, Omicron COVID-19. I've also seen more than 1.2 trillion in terms of the impact of the Russian and Ukraine war. If that war continues to extend, it's going to be another 0.6 trillion um, in terms of its impact on the economy. And so those are external factors that we need. Next slide. So from a Nigerian point of view, first is around food inflation. Food inflation continues to be high. And for us, we are affected by a number of factors. It was flood last year, and the expedition of flood again this year. And last year, we had flood in over 33 of the 36 states. And the expedition that will be flood again this year. Of course, we have the insecurity that has affected farmers, and of course, ex-men, those in animal production and crop production. Now, if you look at the growth of sectors of the economy, we realize that the big sectors, the sectors that are big, that employ people, are the ones that are recording very slow growth. So take agriculture. Agricultural growth less than 3% in the first three quarters of last year. And so increasingly, we're getting more growth from services and less from agriculture, less from manufacturing. But a nation that can't feed itself, a nation that can't 
produce basic things, and we will not live on services alone. And so, inflation needs to be tamed to allow good growth. And what we've seen in 2022 is that growth came from sectors that are of less job impact and that are also smaller sectors of the economy. Next slide. And inflation, if you had a thousand naira by the beginning of last year, you end up with less than 900, less than 850 naira, purely from an inflationary point of view. The average food basket increased from 17 to 18.8% last year. And so the average person is directly impacted by the inflation, whether it is cost push or is demand pull. Next slide. And so wherever you look, things have gone up. Imported foods went up by 17.8%. Non-alcoholic beverages by 20.1%. Recreation and culture, 15.5%. Perhaps the only thing that didn't increase is probably the cost of data. I think beyond that, every other thing um, that you look at has increased, including PMS. Next slide. And so from all sectors of the economy, we are being um, affected. So in 2019, we increased the minimum wage to 30,000. In dollar term, that would be like $82. But if you move to 2022, or by the end of 2022, that your $82 has reduced, and of course, Looking at the twin impact of inflation and um, FX rates, your 30K will not buy the same thing in 2019 as of, as of today. We'll probably spend less than 20,000 20, worth. And of course, from a dollar point of view, move from the two to less than $30. So either way, things are not as good. Next slide. And what that has meant is that more Nigerians have moved into poverty. Either multidimensional poverty, in looking at access to health, access to education, access to capital. Last year, well over 5 million Nigerians moved into poverty, and now we have a situation where 6 out of every 10 Nigerians is facing multidimensional poverty. And over 95 million Nigerians are said to be multidimensionally poor. That's almost 40% of us. And so inflation, taming inflation, and accelerating growth are two important topics to ensure that more people can be lifted out of poverty. Next slide. And so how can we use fiscal and monetary policies to promote growth and to curb inflation? Next slide. If only just to ensure that less people are in poverty, because the more impoverished people are, the less hope they have, the more jackpot we will have, the more insecurity we will have. And so for our own um, self-interest, it's important that we battle inflation and we battle, we seek to promote growth. So, fiscal authorities will use tax, we use government spending as ways to drive growth or to reduce inflation. What the monetary authorities will use cash reserve requirements, we use monetary policy rates as ways to tame inflation and also to redistribute wealth in some form. So how are we doing? Next slide. So how well, how well has Nigeria failed? And in the fact that we are talking about it today suggests that we are not satisfied with what has been done. Inflation, still double digit, and rising. Next slide.
So from a fiscal policy point of view, the government is not earning enough money. We've always earned less than budgeted. Second, the money we spend, we spend more on recurrent, on overheads, and less on capital. And so we are not spending right. We are also not earning right anyway. And so because we are not earning enough, we are running a huge deficit. We're taking loans, including loans from what you call the ways and means by the CBN in an unsustainable manner. Next slide. And so the ways and means, the printing of money, is also part of what is fueling the inflation. Because when you have too much money chasing too little goods, prices will continue to go up. So what have the fiscal, the monetary authorities done? CBN itself keeps increasing the interest, the NPR rate. Yesterday was 17.5%, even though savings rate is quite low. And so those who save are punished. Because the money you save will be eaten up by inflation. And so the incentive to save is not there. The incentive to invest is not there. And most people will, just, will better just dollarize and keep their money in dollar, knowing that it will move from 450 to whatever. Next slide. The CR at 32% means banks need to keep almost a third of their cash sterilized with the banking uh, authorities. And then we spend on subsidies. And subsidies is not wrong if it's spent in a targeted manner. You know, if you spend subsidy on health, if you subsidize on education, through scholarship schemes, health through the health insurance scheme for universal health coverage, that is targeted. But last year, we spent well over six trillion or so on PMS, more than four trillion, five trillion on PMS. As opposed to spending on education, less than a trillion, spending on health, less than a trillion by the federal government. And so the spending on human development or human capital is far less than what we spend on petrol. Now, whether that is actual spending or is diverted, it's something to be to talk about. Next slide. And so, monetary policies, the monetary authorities keep increasing rates to curb the flow of money in the economy. And so whether you look at NPR rate keeps increasing, or you look at the prime lending rate, maximum lending rate, they keep increasing, or you look at the exchange rates, the gap between the official and the non-official now is well over 60%. And a wise man knows where to, in which market to trade. Next slide. But again, everybody wants to maximize their investment. Last year, the average price of crude oil was well above $100, yet our FS reserves did not move materially for several reasons, low production, etc. The times we had huge movement in the FS reserves were when the a and &E window was created or when you had the SDR drawings last year. Next slide. And so we are at that place where it's difficult to see movement in reserves, even though the price of our major product, oil and gas, has gone up. And we're not benefiting from it. So as a roundup, a few thoughts on the way forward um, for us to consider. Next slide. From a fiscal policy point of view, I think it's time we all, we all agreed to remove the petrol subsidies and spend that money on 
health, on education, on infrastructure, on things that benefit the average person. Second is we, need, we must continue to drive efficiency in the way government spends. So remove subsidies, reduce tax waivers, reduce discretionary waivers to ensure we provide a level playing field and we improve the efficiency of government spending. Null oil revenue has continued to be the saving grace for the last two years or so, and we should continue with that. More of widening the tax net as opposed to increasing taxes. There was a suggestion by us that the education tax should move to 10%. We don't need increased tax. What we need is more tax efficiency in the way we collect our taxes to ensure that more of us pay. And that's what a value-added tax will help do. Tax from consumption, and that cuts across everyone. We also need to think of innovative ways to attract capital as opposed to borrowing. Private capital will go to where it is coveted. And, and Nigeria is a nation that requires huge capital to build infrastructure, to build hospitals, to build schools. And so government must think through PPP schemes, tax incentives, and other things that will encourage private capital to come into the country. But those private investors will also be assured that when they are repatriating capital or their dividend, um, they will have easy access to FX for them to repatriate their capital. Next slide. And when we do the hard work of inviting private capital, the government doesn't then need to tap into the ways and means of the CBN. The call for a unified exchange rate remains critical so that people, everybody have equal access to FX at the same rate, but more importantly, the stability of the rate. So an investor knows that if I invest today and I need to take out my dividend or my capital next year, there will not be stories and I will not run into FX losses. We also need to have more collaboration between the fiscal and the monetary authorities. Also the trade authorities, the investment authorities, we all need, to, all need to be on the same page. We cannot be promoting trade and listing some 41 items as not eligible for FS. We can't be promoting trade and shutting down our borders. Things need to work together. For years, authorities have talked about the need to reduce the number of agencies at the ports. Instead of reducing, those numbers keep increasing. So it makes it difficult for exporters or for importers. In the late, in the mid 90s, Indonesia undertook a strategic reform of its customs and trade process. And that has led to the growth that we've witnessed in Indonesia. And so the fiscal authorities need to look at how to ensure customs process, clearing, those are aligned to promote trade and not just to drive revenue. Next slide. And so that speaks to working together on the same page. Our policy development must be coordinated to ensure that policies affecting fiscal, monetary, trade, investment are all aligned and working in the same direction. But beyond policy development is also the policy implementation. We also must then ensure that what we've said we'll do, those things are done. An example is the number of agencies in the ports that I mentioned about earlier. We must have clear measurable and quantifiable targets in terms of increasing productivity, in terms of increasing job creation or reducing unemployment, such that whatever growth we have is inclusive and not just focus on a few sectors of the economy. 
as we're having growth in Lagos, we must have growth in other geographies, geographical locations in the country. We also must ensure we build and we promote competition. Competition is what leads to price reduction, is what leads to excellent customer service that we are seeing today in the telecoms industry and probably in the banking industry. And so when we drive competition, either through fintechs that are eating and also competing with the big banks or the telecom players that are competing with the OTP players, the customer ultimately benefits. And so in different sectors of the economy, we must find ways to drive true competition that will lead to high productivity and ultimately reduce costs. And lastly, power, energy, security. Legacy issues, but those issues must be resolved such that the cost of production reduces for the average manufacturer and of course productivity overall can increase. And so taming inflation and boosting growth will require new ideas, bold decisions, and coordination between the fiscal, monetary authorities, the trade authorities, investment, and different sectors of the economy. It's possible. We've seen that in the Asian economies, Malaysia, Indonesia, and so Nigeria too can do it. I look forward to the discussions, and I'm sure we'll tease out a few more things. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, keynote speaker and uh, president of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, Mr. Ni Yusuf.